with Antonio Moore coming to you from Tone Talks. Um, I told everybody I would go live today. I'm going live about Tyler Perry um, and his recent article on uh, blacks and wealth and what Hollywood actually needs and what Hollywood represents for black America. And I just want to give my context, my per, uh, per perception on the whole thing. I'm going to let people fall in because everybody's kind of been waiting for me to speak on this. I did a, a video on Morgan Freeman yesterday. You can check that out on my YouTube channel, Tone Talks, and his ignorant comments on CNN about race and wealth. So just to give a little context of who I am, you know, for those people that have watched before, my name is Antonio Moore. I'm actually an attorney here in Los Angeles. I've done some entertainment work. Um, I was nominated for an Emmy last year on a documentary, Freeway, Cracking the System. It has particular pertinence in terms of this discussion because it gave me a lot of inside, like, knowledge on Hollywood and how it works. Um, so much of what Tyler Perry said is not only a misunderstanding of wealth and race, but it's also a misunderstanding of Hollywood. For those people that don't know, Hollywood is now on its third generation. You know, it had its first run. When I say third generation, many of the people that you see that are producing films, that are making content, that are white, are the grandchildren of the, of the first generation. And it's just the case of it. And I think for him to say that, it totally takes out the nepotism that we do see in the industry. It's just natural that people are teaching their children, feeding them credits, and then actually putting them in position to be the next great filmmaker of any sort. And like, for him not to know that, to him not to know the importance of progeny, it's a problem. And so, you know, like I said, I was, I was nominated for Emmy last year on my documentary, Freeway Cracking the System. Very interesting experience. I it was a documentary on Freeway Rick Ross, on Rick Ross the Rapper, on the crack epidemic. But it also brought me into contact with, with several different individuals that everybody kind of knows on a very intimate level. You know, one, you know in, in, my, in my personal professional kind of experience, I've had a chance to be in the same space on an intimate level, one or two people with, with both Dr. Dre and also Byron Allen. Byron Allen's now a billionaire. I've talked to him for hundreds of hours. You can check out the full, full discussion that was released. On um, my YouTube channel, Everybody Loves It, he talks about black wealth being in the, in the form of economic genocide. He also purchased thegrio.com. Please go support the Grio and all of its wonderful work that they do over there. But I also came into direct, like, intimate contact on a number of occasions with Dre. So, like, one of those was a dinner with me, Dre, and Rick. And it was just, like, it was powerful to be there. But it was also powerful to interject, like, data to both of these men in terms of the damage that Rick wrought and also the reality of what Dre's music did to black America, and then also to give them a chance to review and see information that they might not be aware of. That's the point of those moments. You know, I gave Dre my copy of the new Jim Crow. I just happened to have it in the car. I didn't plan on teaching a lesson. But I gave him the new Jim Crow, kind of went over some pages with him, and then the next time at his house, I gave him Tavis Smiley's book, The Accountable. And it's a powerful book that Tavis did, Accountable. I recommend everybody go pick that up themselves. Because each section is about how you can cause change in your community. And I gave that to him in an audio book. My purpose of saying that isn't so much to interject these two individuals into this conversation. But it's to say, as I get into Tyler Perry, what we have to understand is that whether it be Tyler Perry, whether it be Steve Harvey, whether it be Oprah, when you meet people, meet them as yourself. What's happening in so many ways is that people are meeting these people and attaching their dreams to that meeting. That's not the way any of this works. The reality and the role of black leadership, of the black educated class, is to make sure that information is spread, make sure that information gets in hands that you never know how it affects them. What is happening in some instances is that people are inundating these black like people with the power to have control over you by walking in with your dreams in your purse or your dreams in your backpack. If you walk in as a person, you walk out as a person. And so, like, for me, you know, if you watch the Byron Allen interview, I'm in there. It, 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 I'm in there. I'm in the box. If you w watch how he speaks about me in the beginning, I'm in there. I'm in the box. I'm not in there trying to ask Byron Allen to pay off my student loans. I'm not in there trying to ask him to do my next feature project. 
I'm in there for black America. And I think for a lot of us, we're not recognizing those people that are doing it that way. And before I, I go into Tyler Perry, I want to give a shout out to Monique. You know, Monique did some powerful stuff. You should go check out a couple of the videos. But a lot of people are coming at Monique's uh, left. And they don't know the full story. I'm not saying I know any any particular information that isn't public. But I watched a few videos. Shout out to Yvette Carnell for great work she did this week. And you, you got to understand, from what I saw, from what was released, she got paid $50,000 to do Precious. Fifty grand. It was high risk. She wasn't a producer. She wasn't an investor. And she got fifty grand. And then when it was time to promote it, they didn't want to give her any extra money. And they wanted to pay her in hotel stay. So what happens is everybody kind of knows that black people are poor. And so they, they traffic on that. We're going to get into the data. But you got to understand, black America controls 2.6% of the national personal wealth. All of us together. White America has 90% of the national personal wealth. What that creates is, is, is a stratification amongst black America that is showing up now. I did a piece called The Decadent Veil. And you can go Google these different things throughout it's called the Decadent Veil. And what I talked about is where we're here now. I, I did this three years ago. Bossa, Madam Nowhere picked it up. What I talked about is the problem with black celebrity being the face of black America when black America struggles so much. See, you have to understand that in America we have among the highest wealth stratification between the middle family and the upper family across the board, all races. But in black America, it's multiplied by five. The middle black family with the family car is worth like $5,000. The family car, the couch, depreciating the assets, you don't count. But without it, it's worth $1,700. But the middle black person in the top 1% or black family in the top 1% is worth a million four. What, that's, a, that's like a 200 time multiplier. What you have as a result is that they know that you need this money. When I say they, I'm saying when you go into these people's offices or spaces, they know that you need money. What you can got to make it about is something other than money. That shifts the whole paradigm. And that should be what it is anyway. Let it be about something else other than money. And then if the money comes, it comes. Thanks, Abby. You know, me and Abby did a wonderful... It's funny because I, 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 I'm going to tell you guys a little bit of things that I've learned along the way. I want to shout out to Abby. Uh, she just pressed thumbs up. Please go to her page, press like. She used to be the president of the Urban League Young Professionals here in Los Angeles. Me and Abby set up a, a, a we did a, a forum with the producer of Roots, the Roots that was on History Channel. He's the son of the person who did Roots originally. So you think that that's not connected? That's not why he had the rights in his pocket to be able to sit on the Warner lot and do Roots? But but we gonna but we gonna we gonna get to Tyler Perry saying that race isn't involved. It's all green. You know, we did a forum and we brought them down. We brought we, we played Roots and we let everybody in the community talk about what they want to see in the next Roots and how they enjoyed Roots. These are the kind of things that have to happen for Hollywood to see us. And that's what Monique is talking about. Monique is saying this is bigger than a statue. This is bigger than a statue. This is about black Americans, black actresses, black actors, black talent being paid appropriately. And so, like, when I see Tyler Perry, you know, when I see Tyler Perry make the comments that he made in his recent Hollywood Reporter article that we're going to go through, it's a problem. So I kind of wanted to frame the discussion. Now we'll get going, you know, and, and I'll let you guys kind of Google things as we go along. I want you to Google this article. This article right here, I'm going to say the title. This is Tyler Perry's newest article. They named him Producer of the Year. And I want you to kind of understand Tyler Perry's like model and how it affects black America and black talent. But then I also want you to take away the striver hat. What do I mean? Oh, I just want to be a striver. I just want to be just like Tyler Perry. No, really look at his model and what he's saying, and I'll break it down for you so you can understand what that means for everybody that works around him. Let me read a little bit from this article. Again, you can pull it up so you can read along. This is Tyler Perry's newest article on Hollywood Reporter. If you Google Tyler Perry, it'll come up first. He's behind the wheel of his white Bentley Bentiaga, giving a tour of his 330-acre studio at the old Fort McPherson Army Base on the southwestern edge of Atlanta. Perry, 47, 
bought the property in 2015 for 30 million. He won't say how much he's spending to turn it into a new state of the art production complex, except that it's a lot. I call it Tyler Town, says Oprah Winfrey, whose HBO movie The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks was shot on pre existing structures on the property. So this is a little section down below that he talks about how he he puts up output. Then I'm gonna have like three questions or four questions that they asked him, and then the answers that he gave. Then we'll get into it. Output, however, even on this humongous scale, isn't the only reason Perry is Hollywood Reporter's TV producer of the year. There's also control. TV might be a producer's medium, but few others have his near total autonomy. For starters. He writes virtually everything himself. I direct every I direct every scene. He says there's nobody else helping me. I'm doing it all. Before I get to the questions, understand. He is sounding like a narcissist. Understand when you say I that many times, you're not recognizing that somebody got to bring in that sandwich for you to eat. Understand that when he says I that many times, he's not res respecting that somebody has to sweep that floor that might look like your uncle. Understand that he's not respecting the fact that you can't hold every camera at once. The reality of what has happened to black America and black celebrity is that we have fractured down to the individual and the individual then traps himself in everything but community. You can't be happy without community. All the money in the world can't do nothing for you if you can't go nowhere with somebody. It's funny because when I was doing the doc with Free Ray Rick, I'm not bringing up crack to say it was a good thing. But one of the things that he explained is that you got to realize the arc. Let me tell you the, the, a short arc on black wealth. Before the 90s, it wasn't no black people with like hundreds of millions of dollars. Before the 90s. Freeway Rick had like millions of dollars every day in the early 80s because of the dope. Around black people that still was without credit. So you got everybody from Russell Simmons to Quincy Jones. This is out of his mouth. This is just talking to me, and I'm giving this context. To He paid for Anita Baker's first album with a duffel bag of cash. He gave it to Dick Griffey, the first album before the rapture. And, and that was he paid for where her, she stayed, the studio, everything for her first album. The reason why I'm giving that context is for all of the failings of those crack men, those, those, those dope boys. The one thing that they understood that these people don't is it ain't about I. You know, when I'm sitting there with Dre and with Rick, one of the things that I get from both of them is the reason that they were so successful is they wanted other people to be successful. With Dre, is whether it be Cube, whether it be Snoop, whether it be 50. With Rick, it's all the people that was around him. Ain't no point in, he told me, ain't no point in going to the Aspens by yourself. So here we have a visual of Tyler Perry driving by himself. No, not his wife, not his kids, driving by himself in a Balenciaga across his lot and saying, I film everything. That sounds like a narcissist. I'm going to let y'all feel on, on what that means for the black community. And we're going to get into what his views are of the black community and his role with the black community, despite the fact that we held him up. We created this man, and now we've created a monster. And it's our job to rein that monster in and tell them not on our watch. And we can do that. Let me give y'all some solutions towards the end. So let's, add, let's look at some of the questions that the Hollywood Reporter asked Tyler Perry in this article that came out yesterday or the day before this week. He's, the first one they say is, how do you manage to have so much control over your productions? It's a very un-Hollywood way of operating. He says, because I know my audience, and I think it... If more artists were free to just be raw, some of the stuff that would show up would be phenomenally successful. So here's a guy again, driving a Balenciaga Bentley, talking about I, that says he knows his audience. He knows you. I don't believe he knows us. I believe he knows how to manipulate us because so many of us are strivers and just want to be successful or just want to see a black man in like do some business in a hard industry, but I don't think he knows you and me. And it's our job to let him know that he doesn't know you and me through Twitter, at the box office, through your family. And so like, let, let's keep going and, and look at the next question. 
Who was the first person who ever took a chance on you in the industry? So I'm on the phone with Mike, and he's talking about the guy from Lionsgate, the one of the one of the executives. And I say, listen, I'm not changing anything in my script, and this is what I want to do, and it's got to be done like this. So his his person was this guy from Lionsgate. It wasn't you know he not he's not mentioning all the people that was in the plays. Those people I guess aren't in the industry. He's not mentioning the person that might have made the phone call because you know we black. So your cousin make that phone call to somebody else. He's not mentioning that person. He mentioned in this guy, this guy at Lionsgate as the person. Handing that power over to a white man as, as, as the person who opened the doorways for him to get to black audiences. I don't believe that. Now, what I'm going to say is you also see, I don't know, for all of you guys that, that haven't followed Tyler Perry, I watched his movie uh, several years late because I, I, I didn't want to see it. Diary of a Mad Black Woman. I'm talking about the first one. I thought it was destructive and damaging myself. Everybody can have their right own opinion. I watched the play before I watched the movie. I recommend that you watch both. In the play, what we find is a constructive message of building black relationships. In the play, what we find is, is, is a constructive message that we both can be wrong, both black men and black women. In the play, what we find is growth. What happened between the play and the movie then, if Tyler Perry had full control? In the movie, what we find is destruction of black relationships, destruction of the black male image, destruction across the board. Go watch it for yourself. You know, in, in the play, she's, a, she's wrong and he's wrong. In the movie, he's grabbing her by the hair and dragging her out the house. If you're making a, a, a movie off the play, you can embellish, but you can't change it. We supported you based on the play. But then you made a movie that was a mockery, that played to all the bad feelings that our race has about each other, to sell tickets. And so, like, you know, moving on, the next question that they ask him is, who were your role models in the business? Hands down, Cosby and Oprah. Because we had the same skin color, and it lets me know it was possible. That's good. I did a piece called Cosby Show Dreams. Go Google Cosby Show Dreams. It'll be the first thing. My issue is that between Oprah's vision boards and aspiration and Cosby projecting while a constructive like image of the black family, but incomplete reality of their wealth, it created a crazy Tyler Perry. And I don't mean that in a, in, in a way to be bringing him down or denigrating. I'm talking about crazed about what the image of black success is. His image of black success is himself driving a Balenciaga with no kids in the back seat, saying, I did it all. That is not a constructive message for the entirety of black America. Thank you. Shout out Alvin Cohen's. So true. I saw the play in the movie. So... The last question before I get into more of an analysis is they asked him this question. And this is what made me do the video. Do you think that Hollywood has respect for African-American audiences? This is his answer. Listen, let me tell you something about what I know about Hollywood. I don't think it's black and white. I think it's green, referring to money. It's just about where's the money? How do we make the money? How do we make the business grow? It's all about money. So whatever is making money is where the respect is going to be. So what Tyler Perry fails to understand is race and the historical cost of being black roots the very essence of the American dollar. Let me say that again. Race and the historical cost of being black roots the essence of of the American dollar. There was a great line done by a Yale professor where he showed that black slaves, their bodies, just their bodies, were worth more in 1800 than all the railroads, than all the land, than all the steel combined. Our bodies and the bodies of our, of our forefathers undergirds the currency. That's the part he doesn't seem to understand. And so, like, what you see is Tyler fails to understand by making it about green money, you are also locking out blacks that have no access to green money. 
you you got to come back to what I told you earlier that ninety percent of the national personal wealth in one of the if the, the richest country in the world is in white accounts. Ninety percent. Our families largely are invisible. We have two point six percent of the national personal wealth. Most of it is in boomer homes. Understand what that means in terms of access and dreams, whether it be a movie or anything, a business. This is the part everybody says about, about power and, and making things is they don't understand. That means that we rely on loans at predatory rates to get us in the game. So we're behind the eight ball when the game starts. So... I want to. I want you guys all to, to to pull up an article. Don't read it now, but but pull it up, and then I want you guys to look at it later. I'm gonna pull it up for you guys right now. It's called the 100 year old penalty for being black. The 100 year old penalty for being black. I, I shared this article in the Morgan Freeman piece. It just came out on the 16th, literally three days, two days ago, and I want you guys to read that article later. Read Tyler Perry's comment and then read that article uh, later. Again, the comment is, I don't think it's black and white. I think it's green. It's about green in Hollywood. So this is a, a small section from that article, not to kind of get off point, but it says, between 1880 and 2010, whites showed much higher rates of upward mobility than blacks, even if their parents started from the same economic position. There is a specific penalty for black people, which is independent of whatever income their fathers earn. And that has been constant for over 100 years. So here we have one of the most powerful black people in the country, and he refuses to acknowledge race. That's why I shout out Byron Allen. Byron Allen sued Charter, Comcast, AT&T, settled with AT&T for seven channels worth a billion dollars now. Byron called this an economic genocide. Me and Byron did a piece called The Eight Solutions to Make America Great Again that's in Huffington Post that gave solutions to Obama that he did not enact to help black people. We need more Byron Allens. We need more Moniques and less Oprahs and less Tyler Perrys. We cannot afford to support you and to hold you up for you to say, I did it when Hollywood Reporter comes around that I am not about race when Hollywood Reporter comes around. And so, you know, for those people that, that don't think that's what he was saying, let's make this literal and say that's what he was saying. This is an article from June 2015. That's a, You can go Google it, Tyler Perry saying, I'm not the person to ask about race in Hollywood. So you have an African-American male making Medea movies about black culture, telling, black, telling Hollywood executives that might need to have insight into black America, that he's not the one to ask about race. See, Tyler Perry's acting like he's making Friends, the, the TV show, and like he's making like action movies. And even then, I, I would still have a problem because so many of the access points might have came through government programs that Dr. King, that, that great civil rights activists set up, but at least your content would be race neutral. 15 of your 18 movies is like is like Medea stuff. It's all us. You know, one of the things that you realize about like people like this is that, and you guys might not be aware, I'm not saying this in any kind of way to, to be condescending, but when you live away from black people for 25 years, you need black people to teach you how black people live in today. So if somebody is interjecting all the, the, the language, the cool language of today, that's happening all throughout Atlanta into his psyche so he can say, I did it. This is crazy, man. And so, in this article where he said he's not the person to ask about racism in Hollywood, they say this, in a conversation with Ava DuVernay, on the second day of the Producer Guild of America's annual conference, Perry said his audience is defined more by class than by race. I did an interview with Sandy Darity. Those people that follow my channel understand. 
Go Google Antonio Moore and Sandy Darity. He's the Duke law professor. I'm sorry. He's the Duke professor of economics, one of the leading racial wealth prof professors in the world. Sandy Darity, D-A-R-I-T-Y. The YouTube video is on my channel. What he tells me is what is at the core of disadvantage in this country is race. It's not class. Race undergirds why we are poor. It's redlining and slavery. It's all the gaps of mass incarceration of why black men go to jail way longer than white women for stabbing somebody. And so, like, we, we continue on, and what he says, meaning Tyler Perry in the same articles, is he told, he's, there's, a class, there's a certain class of people that I come from who know what I'm talking about, who get it, he said. There's this other class who simply say, what is this shit? He told DuVernay his career hurdles, likewise, have more to do with his unconventionality than his race. I'm not the person to ask about racism in this town. I've never had to go through things others have to get things done. Diary of a Mad Black Woman. We put the movie out on Oscar weekend and it opens with $25 million in 05. I get the phone call. They, the audience showed up. So here you have a, a, you know, he's putting together these little movies, little cheap movies. And then black people are showing up using their last dollars to, to support this movie. And then he doesn't speak out for them and says, it's not about race. Well, your whole career is about race. You're not making groundbreaking or genius content. You're making content that resonates with black people and then everybody else follows. But the issue, the issue is without our validation nor our dollars, nobody would come and attend. And the thing that we have to start being aware of, whether it's Morgan Freeman, Oprah, Tyler Perry, Lee Daniels, is we got to hold them accountable. We got to move to, you know, we had our low period from 1982 when Michael Jackson came out, 1980 when Michael Jackson came out, to about last year. But when people like Steve, Steve Harvey come out, when people come out like what happened with Monique, you need to step into the light, similar to what we saw from Yvette Carnell. With her, with her support of Monique, and say, this is wrong. We're not going to support you unless you get it right. This sister won an Oscar, and you paid her $50,000 and no ownership. Pay her correctly now. And so I want everybody to kind of get context on Medea now. You know, I, you know I, can't, I can't leave this conversation without giving context on Medea. And so Medea... You know, I've always had issues with it, but I think this sister here, she did a piece in the Daily Beast. You know, this is a legitimate site, and it's called Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry's Medea Minstrel Show. You can go Google it, Tyler Perry's Medea Minstrel Show. In it, what she talks about is the exploitation of historically exaggerated black characters is a fundamental feature of Tyler Perry's work. So I want to read this 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 section from there and then come back to my view and then move towards closing out some. And I appreciate everybody coming in and actually commenting. Shout out to Otis. Medea is a death blow for males. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but I definitely think that this, that is a highly problematic imagery for me. Uh, so let me read this section and then we'll come back and we'll do a critique together Again, Medea's minstrel show on the Daily Beast uh, website. Perry is a critical pariah. Art-wise, the critiques of Perry are plain and practically indisputable. His visual choices are boring at best. Characters are comically flat. Plots are so predictable they, bo they border on insulting. And even the most commendable performances are drowned by limp screenwriting. But he did this, you remember? I do it all by myself. You, maybe if you spread it out, it wouldn't be all this, 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 what she says. To have seen one Medea film is to have seen them all. What's uglier, however, is his standard go-to combo of minstrelism and moralism. As has been widely noted, the exploitation of historically exaggerated black characters is a fundamental feature of Perry's work. 
Ma Bell Medea Simmons, the temperamental, bumbling matriarch at the helm of a large Atlanta family whose members misbehave full time in more than 15 of Perry's films and plays, embodies the minstrel show like use of negative stereotypes associated with black people. The purpose of entertaining, she is buffoonish, lazy, and greedy. His treatment of the black men and women who, who belong to Medea's narrow world further perpetuates the worst of cartoonish tropes about African Americans. Men are inherently predatory and abusive and good for nothing. Women are immoral, manipulative, and bound to miserable fates. Woo, this sister got it in. Again, this sister is Rawaya Kamir. Shout her out. Support her. This is a powerful piece. That Perry, this is the rest of it, that Perry's work is considered to be a defining voice of black culture and black life is more dangerous than the existence of his work alone. By virtue of their success, Perry's films discount possibility that other black narratives are plausible. But squarely placing the blame on Perry is unfair and counterproductive. The answer lies not in silencing one black voice, but empowering more of them. And it was interesting because everybody had this this like view on go and pull up the Medea Boo poster, and then go pull up uh, the the uh, the Birth of a Nation poster, and they just wondered why is it that they were so similar? It just didn't need to be so similar. You know, I'm not here to say I have any inside information, but you know, there's a lot of ways to to, to actually make your poster. But it's odd that birth of the nation presented that they were going to use a, a black backdrop with just a face and an open mouth and then you have Medea come out and do the same thing and we just got to wonder where that comes from Who, who's creating these contexts and not saying at the least this is too similar to that, that very powerful film that's being made let's change this just to be responsible or at worst let's copy that to make it like funny and so you know this sister here laid it out I don't have to say much else you know, and so in my view, you know, Medea is damaging. She's damaging to the overall ways that other people see African Americans. She's damaging to the way African Americans see themselves and their grandmothers. And I need we need to think that she's damaging for the fact that she's not a she. We have enough black females that are that age that can't get cast that he could have cast another person. Think about what it takes to be, to have a camera. Then run, behind, run in front of the camera, throw on your wig, then run back behind the camera, and then run in front of the camera, throw on your wig, when you got a better director and an older black woman that can play that role, and you could just be sitting in a chair. I'm just saying, do the math. So, my point is to say, you know, in The Hollywood Reporter, he refers to this context, this context of, he saw his father make $800 houses and then a white man sell them for $80,000 and he wanted to own the house. Now in and of itself, it felt to me that he was not as respectful to the work that his father did and the gravity of a black man making $800 in that time, but that's for him to take on. But more so, what I want to share is a statement that I have. This is directly about Perry. How can a man that talks about wanting to own the house only talk about wanting to own the house and not talk about why he wants to own the house understand what I'm saying here he wants to own the house but he wants to sit inside of it by himself that's not what a house is for see a house got different rooms for different people see a house has a front yard and a backyard because there's somebody in the front and there's somebody in the back. This is a man that wants to own the house, not to give other black people real opportunities for them to grow, but instead for himself. You know, this is a similar conversation again that I, I, I commended Dre on. You know, you look at Dre and I don't know him that well. I'm not saying it. This is a few years ago. But I've had a chance where we sat down and I said, I respect you. For the way that you allow other talent to grow and become individuals upon their own. So many of so many of our black like like people who can control contracts use contracts and poverty to control people's lives. And for me, 
I have to wonder whether Tyler Perry sees the actors and the talent that work with him as part of the house that he owns. I have to look at what happened with Monique and say he probably does. Now, I want to say that black producers to me are trafficking on black community. Yvette Carnell has a great line that what we have in many of these people that we look around the internet and also it, also some of these these supposed big wigs is that it's conservative it's conservatism cloaked in black power. See, they're not producing great content in and of itself. What drives their position in Hollywood is that they can get black eyeballs. What drives their position is that they can get black support. But we're not supporting them because we really like Medea. We can watch that bootleg. We're supporting them because we want to see a black person like successful. But you got to get that energy back like Muhammad Ali said. You got to not be like Tyler Perry and say that race doesn't matter. You know, the last thing I'm going to say is that we have a more recent like example with Perry where Tyler Perry had a TLC drama and he said that reverse racism sparked the criticism of his show. He put all white people or something on the show. And this is the quote. I'm so sick of folks asking me. This is from Tyler Perry. I'm so sick of folks asking me why I have a show full of white folks. A reporter asked me this. I'm thinking, what the hell? Stop asking me that damn question. People are people. Well, Mr. Perry, according to every economist from Thomas Shapiro to Sandy Darity, according to major movers in the industry that own their product, they don't just see like, you know, when you think about Hollywood, you think about Oprah and you think about Tyler Perry, but there's another figure out there and you can go Google him. Google Byron Allen, call him the most powerful, powerful man almost in Hollywood, definitely the most powerful black man because he owned all his content. He owns his. You know, cat, and, and, and he was going to Charter and Comcast, AT&T, trying to get his channel on the line. Not just make some content and then license and then you, you pay me and then you own it. No, I want to own it, the catalog 100%. And so, like, what I say is he called this an economic genocide, and that's out of his mouth, and you can go see the video. Here you have Perry saying people are people. Well, the study... The article I shared, shared earlier said there's a hundred-year-old penalty for being black. He doesn't know that. We got to understand the limitations of what people know. We're giving people credit for being educated in a way that they're not. You see that? I went to UCLA. Like, like I don't understand. A lot of these people went to, like, you got Morgan Freeman. He went to L.A. City College. No disrespect to the young people that are there today getting trades or whatever they're doing, but not on the level. Well, like, this is just another level. And the thing about me, that, that, that the one thing you learn at a, at, at a UCLA is what you don't know. I'm not quoting research that I made. I'm quoting the, I'm standing on the backs of Thomas Shapiro, of Sandy Darity, of Doric Hamilton, of Chuck Collins of the inequality.org. I'm standing on the back of researchers from the Federal Reserve. See, these people just come up with stuff and just make it up based on, like, their general understanding of black people, and they don't know that many black people. Because, you know, Tyler Perry ain't going to come on Crenshaw. And so, like, long story short, what I see is that we got to start keeping our eyes open now about who's speaking for us because they're speaking real wrong. And they're using us to get in the door and then closing it behind them. So let me say this. Celebrating a man with black skin that isn't for us building a studio on the backs of poor black people is not a success. I'm going to end by saying Tyler Perry is the decadent bell. You can Google decadent bell to actually get a full understanding of that. Tyler Perry, to me, is the, is the, the example of the problem of a decadent bell. And we need to move that off of us so that people can see us and let them know. We're not going for it anymore. Thank you for tuning in to Tone Talks. Please share this on all your channels. Um, I appreciate all the support. Go to ToneTalks.org to donate, to subscribe. It takes time to get all this together. My videos, you know, takes, I mean, a lot of time to get all the images and set it all up. Go to ToneTalks.org to support and donate. 
share this, let's get it around, let's get the dialogue going, and let's just, you know, let's let's make it so that these people get challenged so maybe they can change, and if they can't change, we're going to put somebody else in the room.